In this chapter, we will examine the five themes of Sub-Saharan Africa. Specifically, we will 1. Summarize the major ecosystems in the region and how humans have adapted to living in them. 2. Describe the factors that have made wildlife conservation and tourism important aspects of the region's economy. 3. Explain the region's rapid demographic growth and describe the differential impact of HIV AIDS upon the region. 4. Describe the relationship between ethnicity and conflict in the region and the strategies for maintaining peace. 5. Assess the roots of African poverty and explain why many of the fastest growing economies in the world today are in this region. 6. List the major resources of the region, especially met metals and fossil fuels, and describe how they are impacting the region's development. And finally, summarize various cultural influences of African peoples within the region and globally. The Sub-Saharan Africa region consists of 48 states and one territory situated below the Sahara Desert. This region is bounded together by its similar livelihood systems and colonial past. Practically every country in this region was invaded by European powers and colonized. Many of the state borders today are a direct result from the colonization process. The population is mostly rural, fast-growing, and culturally complex. There is a deep legacy of slave trade, which those taken had experienced forced migration and diffusion, especially to the Americas, in vast numbers. The region faces many challenges today to include poverty, disease, violence, and refugees. Many countries outside the region have continuously given assistance to this region, through monetary aid and out outreach programs. On a positive note, many countries within the region have reduced infant mortality, expanded basic education, and increased food production in the last two decades. One of the most transformational changes have been the rapid diffusion of cell phones in the region. The map shows the 48 states and one territory of France which is reunion off the coast of Madagascar of the Sub-Saharan Africa region. This vast region of rainforest, tropical savanna, and desert is home to 900 million people. Much of the region consists of broad plateaus ranging from 1,600 to 65 feet, 6,500 feet in elevation. Although the population is growing rapidly, the overall population density is low. Considered one of the least developed regions of the world, it remains an area of rich in natural resources. The photo on the left shows a subsistent farming family from Iringa, Tanzania, as they pose in their garden. Many African households grow food and tend animals for their own consumption, selling any surplus at local markets. Sub-Sahara Africa is the largest landmass straddling the equator with a remarkably beautiful physical landscape. Called the Plateau Continent, the African interior is dominated by extensive uplifted areas that resulted from the break of, of Gondwana, an ancient mega continent that included Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, Madagascar, and the Arabian Peninsula. This area forms a complex upland area of lakes, volcanoes, and deep valleys. Due to this uplift from the extensive force of the continental drift, East Africa holds one of the most unique geological features called the Great Rift Valley, extending from Ethiopia down to the island of Madagascar. The photo at the top shows the Zambezi River descending over Victoria Falls. A fault zone in the African Plateau explains the existence of a 360-foot drop. The Zambezi has never been important for navigation, but its vital supply of hydroelectricity for Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Mozambique. The other geological feature of this area, shown in the bottom photo, is Mount Kilimanjaro, Africa's highest peak at 19,000 feet and a series of discontinuous volcanic mountains. The Great Escarpment is also another unique geological feature in southern Africa, extending from southwestern Angola to South Africa. Because of this landform, coastal plains tend to be narrow with few natural harbors and river navigation is imped impeded by a series of falls. Unfortunately, amid all this beauty of color and stunning formations are relatively poor soils with few major exceptions, persistent tropical diseases, and frequent droughts, therefore making for, the most, making for most of the eastern portion of this region difficult living conditions. 
For the exception, some of the most fertile soils are in the Rift Valley, enhanced by the volcanic activity associated with the area and support the denser settlements. There are four major river systems that supply water and energy to many of the countries in this region. They are the Congo, the Nile, Niger, and Zambezi. The Congo, shown in the photo, is Africa's long, largest river by volume and flows through the Ituri Rainforest and the Demogra Democratic Republic of Congo. The Nile River, the world's longest, is the lifeblood of Egypt and Sudan. Yet this river originates in the two lakes, Victoria and Edward, in the highlands of the Rift Valley Zone and is an important link between North and Sub-Sahara Africa. The Nile is a critical source of water for countries in East Africa, such as Ethiopia and South Sudan. Like the Nile, the Niger River is a critical source of water for two otherwise arid countries, Mali and Niger in West Africa. The Zambezi is equally as important as a major water source for countries such as Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. Two of Africa's hydroelectric installations are here, the Kariba Dam and the Kebora Besa Dam. Both have been in use for decades. Sub-Saharan Africa lies in the tropical latitudes, therefore containing mostly both wet and dry climates. Much of the region averages high temperatures from 70 to 80 degrees year-round with rainfall from both extremes and varies significantly depending on the time of year. For example, compare the distinct rainy seasons in Lusaka and Lagos. Lagos is wettest in June, and Lusaka received most of its rain in January. Although West and Central Africa are important tropical forests, much of the territory is tropical savanna. This region contains the world's second largest expanse of human, humid equatorial tropical rainforest, which lies mainly in the Congo Basin, extending from the Atlantic Ocean of Gabon into the Democratic Republic of Congo. Unlike most of its global counterparts, vast amounts of this rainforest is still intact, especially in the northwestern portion. However, commercial logging and agricultural clearing have degraded the western and southern fringes. Wrapped around the central African rainforest belt is a great arc that lies Africa's vast tropical wet and dry savannas. Savannas are dominated by a mixture of trees and tall grasses in the wetter zones immediately adjacent to the forest belt and shorter grasses with fewer trees in the drier zones. A larger area of wet savanna, as shown in the top picture, exists south of the equator. Buffalo gather at a watering hole in Zambezi National Park in Zimbabwe. The savannas of southern Africa are a noted habitat for the region's larger mammals, including buffalo, elephant, zebra, and lions. The vast extent of tropical Africa is bracketed by several deserts. The Sahara, the world's largest desert and one of the driest, spans the region from the Atlantic coast of Mauritania all the way to the Red Sea off the coast of Sudan, and a narrow belt of desert extends to the south and east of the Sahara, wrapping around the Horn of Africa and into northern Kenya. The Namib Desert, as shown in the photo at the bottom, is situated in the southern portion of the region, more specifically along the coast of Namibia. The dunes of this desert can reach 300 feet in height, and rainfall is a rare event. Inland from the Nahib, Namib is the Kalahari Desert. However, the Kalahari is not dry enough to be classified as a true desert because it receives slightly more than 10 inches of rain a year. Surface water is scarce, giving the Kalahari a desert-like aspect for most of the year. The map shows the environmental issues in the region. Given the immense size of Sub-Saharan Africa, it is difficult to generalize about environmental problems. Dependence on trees for fuel places strains on forest and wooded savannas throughout the region. In semi-arid regions such as the Shehel and Horn of Africa, population pressures, climate change, and land use practices seem to have acerbated desertification. Yet Sub-Saharan Africa also support, supports the most impressive array of wildlife, especially large mammals on Earth. There are no questions to answer he here, but please pause the video and study the map to get a sense of the environmental issues and where they are located. 
Desertification is the expansion of desert-like conditions as a result of human-induced degradation and is a main problem for this region. The Shehel is one of the areas that is hardest hit by desertification. The Shehel is a zone of ecological transition between the Sahara in the north and the wetter savannas and forests of the south. This area is dense with people who rely on agriculture since the land there is fertile, but it is also one of the most vulnerable areas in terms of drought, which could increase the encroachment of desertification. Another cause of desertification is transhumance, which is the movement of animals between wet season and dry season pastures and practiced by the pastoralists as a way of life and income. Unfortunately, overgrazing of livestock and the forced production of certain crops by the former colonies have depleted soil fertility, adding to the pressures of desertification. In the photo, a woman prepares millet grains grown near the city of Maradi, Niger. The soils of the Shehel are fertile, and peasant farmers can produce a surplus when adequate rain falls. Yet, in times of drought, crop failure can lead to famine in this region. The other significant environmental issue is deforestation. Although Sub-Sahara Africa still contains extensive forests, much of the reason region is either grasslands or agricultural lands that were once forests. But unlike Latin America, much of the wood cut has been used for energy needs and not commercial logging efforts. Biofuels, which are wood or charcoal, is mainly used for household cooking and leading source of energy for rural settlements. Loss of Woody vegetation has resulted in an increase in runoff, soil erosion, destruction of wildlife habitat, and extensive hardship, especially for women and children who must spend many hours a day looking for wood. The photo shows women carrying firewood back to their homes. In some countries, village women have organized into community-based non-governmental organizations, abbreviated NGO to plant trees and create green belts to meet ongoing fuel needs. One of the most successful efforts is in Kenya, which is spurring a pan-African green belt movement. This movement covers biofuel generation, protection of the environment, and the empowerment of women. The people in this region suffer from various energy, serious energy shortages. At the same time, foreign investors are actively developing the region's supply of oil and natural gas, mostly for export. The map shows energy production in the region, which many states produce oil and natural gas. Two of the region's largest producers, Nigeria and Angola, are members of OPEC, yet many states still receive the majority of their total energy from burning wood and agricultural wastes. They do not use their own oil and natural gas mainly due to government corruption and lack of infrastructure like roads and electricity to distribute it to its local population. The purple bars show the percentage of people still using renewable biofuels for their energy needs. Sub-Saharan Africa is famous for its large mammal wildlife and in trying to protect and live harmoniously with these creatures, many states have created wildlife reserves, which poaching is not allowed. Poaching had been a serious problem to the extent of some of these animals becoming extinct. The photo shows a white rhinoceros grazing in the savannas of Kruger National Park in South Africa, one of the region's oldest wildlife parks. A protected and endangered species White rhinos are found in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Angola, and Kenya. In 1989, a worldwide ban on ivory trade was imposed as part of the CITES Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Some countries such as Zimbabwe and Namibia and Botswana complained that their herds were growing and the sale of ivory helped to pay for conservation efforts. In 1990, the ban was lifted so that some southern African states could sell down their inventories of elephant ivory confiscated from illegal poachers, and limited sales have continued. Global climate change poses extreme risks for this region due to the region's poverty, recurrent droughts, and over-dependence on rain-fed agriculture. Even though it is the lowest emitter of greenhouse gases, it is likely to experience greater than average human vulnerability to global warming of the region's limited resources to both respond and adapt to environmental change. 
the most vulnerable are arid and semi-arid regions such as the Shehel and the Horn of Africa, some grassland areas, and the coastal lowlands of West Africa and Angola. Even without the threat of climate change, famine stalks many areas of Africa. To help identify and monitor these more vulnerable areas with food insecurity, a program called FUSE, Famine Early Warning System Network, was developed. By tracking rainfall, vegetation cover, food production, food prices, and conflict, the network maps food insecurity along a continuum from food secure to famine. For example, in 2005, Niger experienced failed crops due to severe drought and the FUSE network was able to provide relief and therefore reduce the mortality rates that would otherwise happen from this occurrence. The map shows the severity scale from 2013 data. Both Niger and Mali experienced high food insecurity due to the conflict in that area. Please pause the video and answer the following. How is desertification critical in this region? In your own words, using the text as a guide, be specific and thorough with your answer. Most of Sub-Saharan Africa is still developing and therefore is experiencing a rapid population growth. It is expected by the year 2050 the population will double in size to 2 billion people. The population is also very young. In Niger, for instance, the population under 15 is 50 percent as of 2013. Most other countries are in the 40 percent range, <clears throat> and most of the population over 65 is very small with life expectancies around 55 years of age. In addition, families tend to be large with women having an average of five children. High child and maternity, maternal mortality rates can t still continue to plague the region although the good news is that child mortality rates have declined substantially in the past two decades. <clears throat> the two population pyramids show the contrasting demographic profiles of A, the more rural and rapidly growing Ethiopia, and B, the more urbanized and slower growing South Africa. A lost generation of South African women in their 30s is also evident due to the disproportionate impact of HIV AIDS on women in South Africa. The region for the most part is still not highly urbanized, but that is becoming a major trend. In 1980, an estimated 23% of the population lived in cities. Now that figure is 37%. The rest of the region's population live in scattered rural settlements employed in agricultural jobs. Even though there are almost 1 billion people living in this region, population density is not very high as comparable to the United States. The the region is a huge landmass, but this does not give us the full picture of overcrowding. Geographers are also interested in phys physiological density, which is the number of people per unit of arable land. Not all land is usable for habitat or food production. Arable land is that land that can be used for agricultural purposes. Since many of the people earn a living from agriculture, agricultural density is also used to show population pressure and potential food shortages. Agricultural density is the number of farmers per unit of arable land. The agricultural density of many countries in this region are ten times greater than their crude population density. The chart shows the population indicators for all the countries in this region. There are no questions to answer here, but please pause the video and study the chart. Look at the RNI, most of which are well above the replacement level of 2.1 and total fertility rates are high. These two indicators along with declining death rates therefore tell us that the population is growing rapidly. Think about what the population pyramids may look like. Also take a look at the anomalies with population density. What would be the reason that some countries are below 10 which seems to be an extreme? Even though the human population has experienced plagues that wiped out scores of people, HIV and AIDS have been the most deadliest epidemics in modern human history over the last four decades. The good news, it is beginning to decline mainly due to education and that HIV is a treatable disease but still deadly. This has been especially true for this region where two-thirds of the total infected population can be found. 
The virus is thought to have originated in the forest of Congo through the transmission of blood from chimpanzees to humans when humans sometimes when humans sometime in the nineteen to humans sometime in the nineteen fifties. The map shows the rate of infection and in between genders in two thousand and twelve. As you can see from the map, infection rates were highest in southern Africa, especially in Botswana, South Africa, Swaziland, and Lesotho. Infection rates are generally higher among women than men. In Swaziland, for example, 30% of women are infected with the virus, whereas only 21% of men are infected. Social and economic impacts have been tremendous due to the disease. Life expectancy rates tumbled in a few places to as early as in the 40s and AIDS typically hits the most economically productive population, which has placed a strain on the already inadequate social services programs in the hardest hit areas. The, the population density map of the region shows that the majority of the people live in the most fertile areas with patches of uneven density, but more importantly, the majority of the people live in rural areas. However, some of these rural zones, such as West African highlands, are densely settled. Major urban centers, especially in South Africa and Nigeria, support millions. As more Africans move to cities, patterns of settlement are evolving into clusters of higher concentration. Towns that were once small administrative centers for colonial elites grew into major cities. Lagos, Nigeria, is the one megacity again a city with over 10 million people in the region, but some three dozen cities have more than one million residents. West Africa, Highland East Africa, and eastern half of South Africa have some of the best soils and therefore have developed permanent agricultural systems in those areas, including growing crops and pastoralism. The staple crops over most of the region are millet, sorghum, rice, and corn, as well as a variety of tubers and root crops such as yams. Not all the areas that engage in agricultural production are done where fertile soils are plentiful. In these areas, growing crops usually entail shifting cultivation called swidden. This process involves burning the natural vegetation to release fertilizing ash and planting crops such as corn, beans, sweet potatoes, banana, papaya, manioc, yams, melon, and squash. Export agriculture is critical to the economies of many states. Most of the exports are primary products derived from farming, mining, and forestry. What is interesting to note is that though the, the slave trade, Africans introduced rice cultivations in the Americas while corn was introduced to Africans from the other the other way around. The export crops are coffee, tea, rubber, bananas, cocoa, cotton, and peanuts. Women in Kenya, as shown in the photo at the top, cut roses for export at a greenhouse in Navasha. Floriculture is a vital contributor to Kenya's agricultural exports and have grown dramatically in the past two decades. One third of the cut flowers sold in Europe, especially roses, come from Kenya. Animal husbandry, which is the care of livestock, is extremely important in the semi-arid portions of the region. Camels and goats are the principal animals in the Shehel and the Horn of Africa, and cattle are raised farther south. Two Ethiopian girls, as shown in the bottom photo, walk along a herd of cam camels. Camels are well suited for the arid conditions of eastern Ethiopia and Somalia. Pastoralists rely on their camels for milk, transport, and trade. The main issue with raising animals is the infestation of tsetse flies, which spreads sleeping sickness to cattle, humans, and some wildlife. The region is one of the least urbanized regions in the world. However, the cities see, are seeing a surge in population and are growing due to rural to urban migration, industrialization, and refugee flows thus creating overcrowding and urban primacies to evolve. Many urban primacy, again, urban primacy is when one major city is dominant and at least three times larger than the next largest city. Most of these cities were not built nor planned for the amount of residents they now hold. Therefore, most of the city's inhabitants live in the vast slums that surround the modernizing urban core. The West African coastline is dotted with large cities from Dakar, Senegal, 
in the far north to Lagos, Nigeria in the east. The photo at, on the top shows downtown Lagos where a sea of shoppers, vendors, and buses fill the streets of Oshadi Market, the commercial hub of Lagos. Most West African cities are hybrids, com combining Islamic, European, and national elements such as mosques, Victorian architecture, and streets named after independence leaders. Due to influx of foreign investment, Accra, Ghana is growing rapidly, resulting in highly segregated urban spaces. The photo at the bottom is an elite Accra neighborhood in the Legion area east of downtown where you would find the nicest homes, private schools, and the University of Ghana. The major cities of Southern Africa, unlike those of West Africa, are colonial in origin. The form of South African cities continued to be imprinted by the legacy of apartheid, an official policy of racial segregation that shaped social relations in South Africa for nearly 50 years. Part of apartheid was the segregation of housing where all cities were divided into areas according to racial categories, white, colored, which is a mixed race of African and European ancestry, Indian from South Asia, and African or black. Whites resided in the most appealing and spacious portions, while blacks were crowded into the least desired areas forming squatter settlements called townships. As apartheid ended, Johannesburg became infamous for its high crime rate where many white-owned businesses fled the central business district for northern suburb of Sandston. The photo shows the downtown area of Sandston. Sandston has emerged as the financial and business center of the new South Africa, with world-class shopping, hotels, a convention center, and even Nelson Mandela Square, Sandston has become a part of Johannesburg that most tourists and business people experience. Today, Sandston is racially mixed, but affluent whites are overrepresented. Please pause the video and answer the following. Explain in detail why and how the region is more rural than urban. In your own words, using the text as a guide, be specific and thorough with your answer. This region is so vast and diverse, with many indigenous peoples at one time having different religions, languages, and political systems, that the only reason there is a basic unified African identity south of the Sahara today was through a common history of slavery and colonialism, as well as struggles for independence and development. Had it not been for colonialism, it is quite possible that West Africa and Southern Africa would have developed into their own dis distinct world regions. The cultural diversity of the region is obvious to any visitor, yet there is unity among the people drawn from surviving these adversities. In most sub-Saharan countries, as in former cl colonies, multiple languages are used that reflect tribal, ethnic, colonial, and national affiliations. The map shows the various language families in the region. Mapping language is a complex task for this region. There are languages within million, with millions of speakers, such as Swahili, and there are languages spoken by a few hundred people living in isolated areas. Six language families are represented in the region. Among these families are scores of individual languages. Because most modern states have many indigenous languages, the colonial language often became the official language because it was less controversial than picking many indigenous languages. English and French are the most common languages in the region as shown in the inset. The photo on the left depicts a sign in South Africa that is written in three different languages, English, Afrikaans, and Zulu. Throughout Sub-Sahara Africa, many people are multilingual because of the diversity of languages that exist in each state. Indigenous African religions are, awful, are often called animist which are centered on the worship of nature and ancestral spirits, but the internal diversity within the animist tradition is vast. Christianity was introduced into the region from the beginning mainly in northeast Africa. The peoples of Ethiopia and Eritrea adopted the Coptic form of Christianity and thus historically looked to Egypt's Christianity for their religious leadership. The photo shows Eritrean Coptic Christians gather for an Easter celebration in Asmara, Eritrea. 
Other parts of the region were introduced to Christianity through European settlers and missionaries. The introduction and spread of Islam began to advance a thousand years ago. The map shows the extent of Islam in the region. Muslim majorities prevail in the Sahelan states that border North Africa as well as Somalia and Djibouti. There are also large Muslim minorities throughout West and East Africa. It is important to talk about the African slave trade in this region. The slave trade had a devastating impact on sub-Saharan societies. Tra tragically, slavery damaged the demographic and political strength of African societies, especially in West Africa, from where most slaves were taken. From ship logs, it is estimated that 12 million Africans were shipped to the Americas to work as slaves on sugar, cotton, and rice plantations. As the map shows, the majority went to Brazil and the Caribbean. Yet other slave routes existed, although the data is less reliable. Africans from south of the Sahara were used as slaves in North Africa. Others were traded across the Indian Ocean into Southwest Asia and South Asia. Out of this tragic displacement of people came a blending of African cultures with Amerindian and European ones. Some of the cultural assets have been in music and dance. Nigeria is the musical center of West Africa with a well-developed and cosmopolitan recording industry. Modern Nigerian styles such as Juju, High Life, and Afrobeat are influenced by jazz, rock, reggae, and gospel, but they are driven by an easily recognizable African sound. The photo on the left shows the Turag band Igbeyan playing at the Mali Festival in the desert. This annual winter festival in the oasis town of Essekane, Mali, draws thousands of Malian musicians, Tureg nomads, and Western tourists. In addition to music, is some of the world's best athletes, especially runners from the countries such as Ethiopia and Kenya. Running in a national pa running is a national ta pastime in Kenya and Ethiopia, where elevation increases oxygen carrying capacities. The photo on the right shows runners from Ethiopia and Kenya leading the pack in the 10,000 meter race during the 2012 London Olympics. Ethiopia took gold and Kenya took silver and bronze. Please pause the video and answer the following. When contemplating this statement, out of tragedy came blessings. Describe how slavery impact both Africa and the Americas in both negative and positive ways. In your own words, using the text as a guide, be specific and thorough with your answer. The duration of human settlement in this region has been the longest by that of any other region. Evidence shows that humankind originated here and over time many diverse ethnic groups formed. Although conflicts among these groups have occurred, cooperation and coexistence among different peoples have also continued over centuries. Like many regions, especially in the western and southern hemisphere, the political boundaries were non-existent as we see today. The map shows early sub-Saharan states and empires long before Europeans advanced their territorial claims. Most African kingdoms ceased to exist by 1900. The Burganda in Uganda and Abyssinian in Ethiopia existed well into the mid-20th century. Unlike the rapid colonization of Americas, it took Europeans several centuries to gain effective control over Africa. The early Europeans to arrive were the Portuguese in 1400 and 1500s, but these settlements didn't last long. It was due to the disease environment with no resistance to malaria and other tropical diseases that limited European settlement until the mid-19th century. Other early Europeans were mainly traders for slaves, golds, and I gold and ivory. However, an early successful European country to settle was the Dutch, who settled south into South Africa, much below the tropical disease so zone. In the 1850s, European doctors discovered that a daily dose of quinine would offer protection against malaria, therefore enabling many Europeans to arrive and stay. By the 1880s, European colonization quickly accelerated, leading to the so-called scramble for Africa. As the colonization intensified, tensions grew among the colonizing forces and therefore convened in Berlin to carve up the region to avoid war. This was called the Berlin Conference. By 1913, 
Africa was divided into the states as you see in the map. The only countries not under European control were Ethiopia, Liberia, and South Africa. They led effective resistance campaigns and were able to ward off any European advancement, even though South Africa had already been invaded by the Dutch. They were proclaimed as self-governing by 1910. Decolonization of the region happened rather quickly and peacefully in the mid-20th century. Many Africans pushed for independence with the support of outsiders like, like W.E.B. Dubois and Marcus Garvey, who founded the Pan-African Movement in 1900 to encourage a trans-Atlantic liberation effort. By the 1950s, Britain, France, and Belgium decided that they could no longer maintain their African empires and began to withdraw. By 1960, virtually the entire region had achieved independence. The photo depicts a statue monument of an independence leader, Julius Nyerere, who led and was considered the founding father of Tanzania from 1961 and to 1985 when he retired. There are many other leaders like him during the decolonization period who aspired to see the whole continent politically unified. There were a few independence movements that did not come easily, especially in southern Africa. Whites who were in power in some of the countries like modern-day Zimbabwe, Angola, Mozambique did not want to relinquish their power, whereas rebel movements began fighting. South Africa was a unique situation since they had gained independence already and a mix of white and black had already existed long before this time. They were excluded from this mass movement of independence. Their racial struggles came long after due came long after due to their oppressive apartheid rule still in existence until its demise in the 1990s. As apartheid ended in South Africa, a new leader emerged, Nelson Mandela, who became the president after being imprisoned by the former regime for 27 years. Black and white leaders pledged to work together to build a new multiracial South Africa starting with the abolishment of the homelands. To help facilitate interregional exchange and development, many states formed regional supranational organizations as outlined on the map. Political affiliations are both continental and regional. The African Union includes all African countries. Smaller organizations such as SADC, ECCAS, and ECOWAS represent regional affiliations. Of these, SADC shows the most economic process, promise. Even though most of these countries made a relatively peaceful transition into independence, virtually all of them immediately faced a difficult set of institutional and political problems. One of the problems they faced was that the old authorities had done nothing to prepare their colonies for independence. This created much chaos for the people due to the lack of education and administrative training. The other, issues, the other issue was the fact that when European powers moved in, they ignored the indigenous cultural and political patterns and boundaries that already existed, much like that of North America. It was then difficult for each country created from European boundaries to unify with the many ethnic groups in existence. Some of them who were enemies now had to join in the same political regime. For example, the Hausa people of West Africa were divided between Niger, formerly French, and Nigeria, formerly British. Therefore, tribalism, which is loyalty to the ethnic group rather than the state, emerged as the bane of African political life, especially in rural areas. Many ethnic conflicts ensued, and the human cost of these conflicts were severe. The map shows several Sahelan and Central African countries ex have experienced wars or serious insurrections since 2005. These same states all are also likely to produce refugees and internally displaced persons. As of 2012, nearly 3 million Africans were refugees and 5 million internally displaced. Genocide has also occurred in this region as well. One current topic that is in the forefront of com is conflict diamonds. These are diamonds sold for the aid to rebel forces in Sierra Leone and Liberia. One result of public concern about conflict diamonds was a certification scheme adopted in 2002 called the Kimberley Process. Its aim is to keep conflict diamonds out of the global market and thus avoid tainting the image of the diamond business. Problematic African political boundaries have occasionally led to attempts by terrorists to succeed and form new states. Many countries have tried or trying to succeed, but only two have done so thus far. Eritrea in 19, 
1993 and South Sudan in 2011. This will probably not be the only two to succeed. Due to the ongoing ethnic battles for power and control, the African political map will most likely change for decades to come. Please pause the video and answer the following. Given the history and current state of ethnic groups, why has this region been difficult to unify politically? In your own words, using the text as a guide, be specific and thorough in your answer. According to the World Bank estimates, Two-thirds of the population in this region live in poverty, which is less than $2 per day. This figure makes the Sub-Saharan Africa region the poorest of all regions. The economic and debt issues that plagued this region in the 1980s and 90s prompted the introduction of structural adjustment programs promoted by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Structural adjustment programs typically reduce government spending cut food subsidies and encourage private sector initiatives. Yet this did very little to relieve the immediate hardships for the poor, especially women and children. On the positive side, since 2000 there had been signs of economic growth and are currently growing at, at a ra faster rate than their population, which is very good news. There are no questions to answer, but please pause the video and study the economic development indicators in the chart. These numbers do not paint a very good picture. There are many reasons for Africa's poverty which has been tied to its colonial history, poorly conceived development policies, corrupt governance, and or physical environment. Many scholars believe that the beginning of the troubles began with the slave trade, which depopulated many areas and left lasting effects on the local economies. The next layer was colonization. European powers invested little in infrastructure, education, and public health and were mainly interested in exploiting the areas for natural resources and their own benefits. Furthermore, many economists argue that the region's governments enacted counterproductive economic policies and thus that thus brought on some of the misery themselves, especially in agricultural and food policies, causing food shortages. Also in building industries where products were not competitively in the open market. I'm sorry, that where products were not competitive in the open market. And the final layer is corruption. Governments were not paying workers adequately and they forced to take bribes or other forms of payment to make ends meet. Some of the countries were dubbed kleptocracies, which is where corruption is so institutionalized that politicians and government bureaucrats siphon off a huge percentage of the country's wealth. However, not as all bleak today. Since 2000, strong commodity prices, new infrastructure, and improved technology have brightened the economic prospects of the region. Over the last decade, real income per person grew, and the optimistic views seen it getting better. This region lies heavily on the help from the rest of the world. The map shows the region's global linkage in the form of aid dependency. Many states in the region are dependent on foreign aid as their primary link to the global economy. This figure maps aid as a percentage of GNI, which ranges from less than 1% to 54% in Liberia. The United States and the European Union provided most of this aid. China, on the other hand, is investing money in the region for the oil and ore it needs for its massive industrial economy. In exchange, China is offering money for roads, railways, housing, and schools with relatively little strings attached. The third development strategy is debt relief by major debtors, who are the World Bank and IMF, that is provided as long as countries qualify with acceptable poverty reduction plans. There are some differences between the rich and the poor in this region. Very few countries have per capita incomes over $5,000. Millions of Africans are still living in extreme poverty in every state of the region. Many of the poor still practice subsistent farming and are barely a part of the formal economy. In urban areas, they live in massive slums just outside the city without access to clean water and sanitation. On the other hand, South Africa is the region's economic powerhouse. It is only South Africa that has a well-developed and well-balanced industrial economy. Oil and minerals are also proved to be prosper prosperous among a select group of countries such as Gabon, the Republic of the Congo, and Equatorial Guinea, Namibia, Botswana, Angola, and Nigeria, but shared only amongst the elite in that country. In the photo, children play on the basketball courts at the Kalambi Kayaxi housing development, a massive Chinese-built project in the suburbs of Luanda, Angola. Most of these apartments remain vacant because they are far too expensive for Angolian workers to purchase. 
By global standards, measures of social development are low in this region, yet there are some positive trends with regards to education, attainment, and women in the workforce and politics. The photo shows Botswana students attending classes at a Lutheran theological seminary in Francistown, Botswana. Religious organizations as well as public institutions are critical in providing educational services. Also, women in the workforce is compatible to that of the developed countries, as 70% of women over the age of 15 are in the labor force. Another significant change for the region is the increase of women holding seats in national parliaments. The map shows the percentage of women in the workforce and who also hold seats in the parliaments. Please pause the video and answer the following. What are the environmental, historical, structural, and institutional reasons offered to explain poverty in the region? In your own words, using the text as a guide, be specific and thorough with your answer.